Good morning, and welcome to St. John on the Desert. Happy spring. I'm Pastor Leslie Abrams. And I'm Marcia Soriano. Before we begin worship today, I want to let you know we're trying something new as we continue to improve our recording capabilities. We are going to be recording this worship service from beginning to end. I know that sounds a lot longer than it is going to be in actual minutes. Um, but in the meantime, I invite you to continue to come by the meditation garden at St. John and offer your prayers by writing them on the fabric that's provided and hanging them from our Shalom prayer tree. We follow Christ who says, take up your cross. We follow Christ who bids us come and offer our lives. We follow Christ who summons us to new life. Come, let us prepare to worship our Creator. of Lent, we are invited to repent and turn from our sins. We're invited to pray more robustly than perhaps we normally do. And we're invited to confess on behalf of a broken world. Here at St. John, we take the opportunity to confess every Sunday. Please join me. God Almighty, we have failed to serve you faithfully, and our lives are anything but blameless. You invite us to see with a new vision, but we continue in our old ways. You call us to set aside our own desires so that we may embrace your desires, but we are stubborn and refuse to let go. Lord, rebuke our shameful ways, guide us to find our place directly behind Christ, and teach us to take up our crosses and follow wherever you lead, we pray. Take this moment and lift what burdens your heart to the God who hears it all. Amen. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. By God's mercy, we are forgiven. By God's mercy, we are made whole. By God's mercy, we are equipped to serve others. By God's mercy, we can take up our cross following Jesus fully and faithfully. Thanks be to God. Amen. Today's ordinary object 
is not quite as ordinary as the coins in our pocket, the shoes we wear, or the bread at our table. Today's ordinary object that connects us daily with God is the cross. A few years ago, it was fashionable for women to accessorize with large crosses, but I suspect many of those wearing them were not particularly religious or even aware of its deeper meaning. Crosses are super popular at tattoo parlors and Hobby Lobby, and if you ask me, anything that connects tattoo parlors with Hobby Lobby is a pretty powerful object indeed. During Lent, I wear my mother's cross. It's to honor her life and the gift of faith she gave me in her later years. Since the beginning of the pandemic, I've worn the same cross earrings when we record worship. It's to honor the friend who gave them to me and the ministry in which she is engaged. In both cases, though, its primary purpose for me is to honor the one I follow. When you stop to think about it, it's an odd thing to wear a Roman implement of death around one's neck or dangling from one's ears. If we really want to celebrate God in Christ, we ought to be wearing little replicas of empty tombs, although style-wise, that might be an artistic challenge with the tomb opening inadvertently resembling a donut. The cross may be one of the most symbolically laden objects in the world. Technically, it was the ro way Romans dealt with traitors, rebels, and zealots. Death on the cross was a form of public execution designed to encourage future acts of rebellion. How odd that this is what we choose to wear around our necks. But of course, we don't wear a cross to honor the cruelty of crucifixion. We wear a cross to honor the one who willingly died upon it so that God's glory could be revealed three days later in the resurrection. We wear the cross to show the world our love for the one who came to heal and teach. We, were, we wear the cross to remind ourselves that Christ has freed us from the heavenly consequences of our sins and that in doing so, our relationship with God is restored. Today's scripture reminds us that the cross is also a symbol of discipleship. From chapter 8, verses 35 through 38 of Mark's New Testament Gospel. I'm reading from Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of the Bible, as this is a challenging piece of scripture. Calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering, embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to saving yourself, your true self. What good would it do to get everything you want and lose you, the real you? What could you ever trade your soul for? If any of you are embarrassed over me and the way I'm leading you when you get around your fickle and unfocused friends, know that you'll be an even greater embarrassment to the Son of Man when he arrives in all the splendor of God, his Father, with an army of the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, first and foremost, Jesus is not suggesting that we all become martyrs. None of us needs to repeat the sacrifice of Jesus. Once was enough for all. This passage is about discipleship, 
which begins with letting go of our egos. Only then can we take up our cross and follow Christ. And note that Jesus doesn't say, take up my cross. He says, take up your cross. The cross of Jesus leads to taking on the sins of the world, a sacrifice for the sake of others, and a willing relinquishment of status, power, safety, and security. My cross, your cross, should share some of these qualities, but it need not lead to death. Taking up our cross means surrendering our own definitions of success, our own sense of what is needed, our own plans for greatness to God's larger hope. Can we do what's right no matter the consequences to our reputation? Can we stand up for what we believe no matter who ridicules us? Can we relinquish our need to win, to succeed, for the sake of a greater good? Taking up the cross, according to today's passage, requires understanding suffering. All of us experience loss, grief, and sorrow. Life is not pain-free. Ignoring our suffering or the suffering of others means we're just going through the motions of living. How can we possibly be the compassionate people we're supposed to be if we refuse to acknowledge this one simple truth? And that is, life is a paradoxical proposition. There is both joy and suffering, pain and pleasure, woe and wonderment. There is no real joy in life without its opposite. This critical passage, smack dab in the middle of the Gospel of Mark, is an invitation to be resurrected along with Jesus. When we take up our cross, we are releasing ourselves from our infatuation with self, what I need, what I want. And we enter into a new life of compassion, seeking justice and equality for others. What do they want? What do they need? Too many of us wallow in our victimhood and overinflated egos. Now, when I speak of egos, I'm not talking here about celebrities or politicians who clearly adore being in the spotlight. That's one kind of ego. But what of us everyday souls who always catch the mistake someone else has made without considering that person's needs or burdens? What of those who go through life finding the splinter in everyone else's eye without acknowledging the log in their own? Have you ever noted that by loving another, you feel yourself to be loved? Have you ever gone without so that someone could have more and then feel intensely richer as a result? Have you ever heard that the better way to find a friend is to be a friend? My point is, unexpected rewards come through sacrifice. Today's scripture passage is a perfect Lenten instruction. If we wander 40 days through the desert of Lent, on our way to the promised land, and we experience no real thirst or hunger, perhaps we should ask ourselves if we are just play acting. Because when we domesticate the landscape of Lent, it tends to lose its meaning. It's not easy to take up one's cross, to join in suffering, to letting go of one's ego, to sacrifice for others but it is what we do if we choose to follow Jesus. My cross is not a good luck charm. I wear this cross to remind myself the, that the old life I led, the one with me at the center, is dead and gone. And my resurrected self, 
the one with others at the center, is far more satisfying and life-giving than I could have ever imagined. Please join me in prayer. God, it's too easy for faith to become an escape a way to avoid the pain of being human and alive, or a path to success, a way to persuade the universe to give us the things we want, or a system of control, a way to bend others to our will. But the faith you offer is different, Jesus, more dangerous and compelling. It's the faith that carries the cross, that embraces death, and lays itself down for the sake of others. It's the only faith that can lead us to resurrection, to life renewed and overflowing. We praise you for this faith, God, and may you open our hearts to receive it. Amen. Marcia and I are going to sing Will you come and follow me? And I think you'll notice that the words are very similar to today's scripture passage. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you attract or scare will you let me answer prayer in you and you in me lord your summons echoes true when you would call my name let me turn and follow you and never be the song move and live and grow in you and you in me. We come to a time of prayer in our worship service. Today, I ask that you pray for Jeannie McArdle, whose mom, 95 years young, died last weekend. I also ask that you continue to pray for John Deering as he takes his cancer journey and experiences chemotherapy. There is one joy in our midst, and I'm so happy to share it with you. The Fanders, Jeannie and Mike, our grandparents for the first time. And finally, Lord, this has been a horrible week for the citizens of Atlanta and for Asian Americans everywhere in our country. Today I ask that you pray that there is an end to hate of the other, that we stop hating people who look different, who are different, who come from different countries, or who were born here and just happened to have parents who were born elsewhere. We are a nation of equals. That is what our founders wanted. And it is our job 
to make that reality happen. Please join me in prayer. Lord, I ask this day that you pray for Jeannie McArdle in her grief, that you be with John Deering in his chemo, that you protect all people, the Asian Americans, the black Americans, the Native Americans, all of whom are our brothers and sisters in this country and hopefully in our faith. Be with all those whose names we do not utter out loud, those who point the way and preach and teach, those who stand tall and protect us from harm. Be with the last, the lost, the least, and the left out, and finally, Lord, with great humility, we ask that you be with each and every one of us, praising you together by saying the prayer your Son taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to support the mission and ministries of St. John on the Desert by visiting our website, stjohnonthedesert.org, and just pressing the Give button. We will soon be together again, and I am so grateful for that. I'm also very grateful for all the volunteers in this one year and more who have come in faithfully to record worship, to be with us during worship, to sing with us during worship, and to pray with us. And finally, as we end our worship today, I invite you to wear a cross, to understand its meaning, and to take it up as a symbol of your willingness to let go of your ego, to sacrifice, and to support those who need our support. Be at peace until we meet again. Amen.